Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. Glad to have you <clears throat> listening along. Today we will be reading from Micah chapter 7, verses 10 through 15, and the title of the message is Returning. But before we read, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you give us the privilege of your word, that you have revealed to us your character in your word. You, you have revealed to us so much that, that there's no way we could otherwise have known about who you are. We ask that you would use your word to search our hearts, that you would use your word to cleanse our hearts and to turn our hearts closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Micah 7, 10 through 15. Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. In that day when your walls are to be built, in that day the decree shall go far and wide. In that day they shall come to you from Assyria, and the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea, and mountain to mountain. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it, and for the fruit of their deeds. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in a woodland, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in days of old, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. Amen. Verse 10, Then she who is my enemy will see, and shame will cover her, who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? Um, and <clears throat> the she that's being referred to this, many times nations, for whatever reason, nations are, are usually, if they're personified at all, they're usually personified as a she. I, I have no idea why that is. Eh, same with ships. Same with cars, usually. I mean, if somebody refers to their, to their vehicle, whether it's a ship or a car, or to their nation, they usually refer to it, for whatever reason, with a feminine pronoun. And so this is referring to those who are the enemies of Israel and Judah. Then she, the enemies, and in this particular time, it would have been the Assyrians, will see, and shame will cover her, who said to me, where is the Lord your God. Now that shame came about, shame will cover her who said to me, that shame will come about as the result of sin. Psalm 35, 26 speaks of that. <clears throat> but one of the things that sin always brings is shame. Now, sometimes we, especially if we persist in something that we know is wrong and we persist in it and harden our hearts, we can come to a point of taking pride in those things. But shame brings sin, and that's actually, it's a gift of God. We may not see it as a gift. We probably won't see it as a gift at the time, but it's, it's God's way of calling to us to turn away from that which is destroying us. Okay. Psalm 35, 26, let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. And that's not God being vindictive in any way. Uh, sin brings its own shame. Whatever sin it may be, whether it's something that's great, big, and egregious, and everybody says, oh, that's a horrible thing to do or whether it's something that's much, much more socially acceptable, it, it brings its own sense of shame, its sense of, you know, I didn't really behave as I should have in that situation. I didn't really have a good attitude toward that person. Now, we can ignore that, and sometimes do, but that is God calling to us in that, that sense of shame. But it goes on to say, the perpetual taunt of the wicked person, whether that wicked person is 
me, myself, or whether that wicked person is somewhere else. Where is the Lord your God? And that's the perpetual taunt of the wicked. Where is God? Psalm 42, 3 and 10, the psalmist describes the enemies of Israel as saying that. I'd like to read from Psalm 79, 9 and 10. Again, you have a, a very similar reproach. Psalm 79, verses 9 and 10. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. And deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants which has been shed. That's a very rich two verses. Um, but, but I would like to point out just a couple of things about those particular two verses. Uh, Asaph is the psalmist here. Asaph came along after David. He, he's named at the beginning of the song. And <clears throat> he says, Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Asaph recognized, as, as we have to recognize, that when we come to God, it's not on the basis of what we've done to deserve his help. Because we've done nothing to deserve God's help. We've rejected him. We've ignored him. We've refused to follow what he clearly told us to do. That, that is our natural condition. We've followed our own ways. But he says, for the glory of your name. He shows his glory in reaching out in love and compassion to a people who reject him and refuse him. Just as Jesus cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. He, they, they do. He was suffering for their sins and for our sins. And he could have said, smite them. And he'd had every right to say that. He'd have been completely and totally justified in saying that. But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was looking at them. He was looking at us, every single one of us, for his name's sake, for the glory of his name. He delivers us. He provides atonement for our sins. He is glorified in showing that mercy to us. Psalm 115, verses 1 through 3. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. And then, then in Psalm 115, uh, the psalmist goes on to describe the, the huge contrast between the false gods that those who do not know God worship and the true and the living God. Joel 2, 17. Also points out this reproach. And this is during a time of judgment. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And that is, <clears throat> that is the universal reproach uh, of those who, who see the long suffering of God, who see evil go unpunished. And, and, and sometimes, you know, if we have our eyes open, We'll see that. We'll see that in the world. We may see that among people we know. Horrible things happen that there is no earthly remedy for. And what, it's, what we are tempted to believe is that God doesn't care or that he's powerless to do anything about it. What is much harder for us to realize is that God is, is very, very patient with them just as he has been very, very patient 
with us. He doesn't desire for anyone to die in their sins. He wants all to come to repentance. And he is, he, he is incredibly patient. I, I, I can't begin to comprehend how patient he is with us. And so what, what those who reject God mistake for apathy or impotence is actually God's patience and compassion and mercy. And then back to Micah, chapter 7, verse 10. Shame will cover her who said to me, where is the Lord your God? So as Micah is prophesying of the judgment of their enemies, my eyes will see her. Now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. Now, you could read that as, as symbolic. Um, you know, it, it kind of sounds like symbolic statement. But you find out later in the book of Daniel and, a, and in secular histories of the time that that is literally what happened to the Assyrians. Because when the Medes and the Persians came against the capital of Assyria, how they were able to get through the, the incredibly thick wall, which was made out of baked mud. Well, in, the, in the desert, baked mud makes a really good wall. I mean, no arrow's going to pierce it. It's easy to repair. You know, you're totally safe. Well, what they were able to do is they were able to stop up the Euphrates River for a period of time and then just release it at one point in a weak spot against the wall and just wash through it. And they washed the wall to nothing. It, was, it became a muddy street, and, the, and, and the, the defenders were literally trampled down like mud in the streets. That, that was not just symbolic language, but Micah is prophesying what literally happened to the Assyrians years later when they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians. <clears throat> Second Samuel 22, 43, and Zechariah 10, 3 through 5, use the same type of language in speaking of how God tramples down those who refuse to listen to him because he is an extremely merciful God. But he's also a just God. And, and there is a time, it may be during our lifetime, and it may not be in our lifetime, but there is a time when his justice will be completely and totally fulfilled. And we, can, we either throw ourselves upon his mercy and grace and find that mercy and grace, or we resist him and become trampled down by his justice. Verse 11 in Micah 7. In that day when your walls are to be built... In that day, the decree shall go far and wide. Isaiah 54, 11 and 12 speak of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And Amos 9, 11 also speaks of that rebuilding, which I'd like to read from. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it, as in the days of old. Despite the devastation that God's people had seen during the time of Micah and during the time of Amos, God is promising that that wall would be rebuilt. And it, as you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, you see a fulfillment of that prophecy. Decades later, um, that a command was given by a pagan king to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in fulfillment of that prophecy. Verse 12, in that day they shall come to you from Assyria and the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Assyria is mentioned several times in in scripture uh, because Assyria was for a long time a, uh, an enemy of Israel. It was, it was the dominant world power. Isaiah 11, 16 speaks of that. I would like to read from Isaiah 
chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. Isaiah 19, 23 through 25. As soon as I find it. <laughs> in that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a mighty one, and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. And they will make sacrifice and offering. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. And the Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord, and he will be entreated by them and heal them. This is speaking of a future time of restoration. Verse 23, in that day there shall be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Now, this is speaking of a future time of reference. At that hasn't been fulfilled to this day. But this is speaking of a future time when God will set up his kingdom upon earth. And those three nations will be a blessing together. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because Egypt was at one time a mighty empire. And it, it still exists as a nation, but it's, it hasn't been a mighty empire for millennia. Assyria... Well, what was Assyria, part of what was Assyria is now the modern nation of Syria. Again, it's not a mighty empire either, although at one time it was. But he's speaking of a future time when all three of those nations, two of which were extremely hostile to the people of God, will be united in serving the Lord and in honoring the Lord in this future time of restoration. In Isaiah 27, 13, in Hosea 11, 10 and 11, God also speaks of this, <clears throat> of Assyria. I'd like to read from Hosea 11, verses 10 and 11. I went too far. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion when he roars, and his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. <clears throat> so God is prophesying here, and this, this prophecy was literally fulfilled, that his people that were in Egypt and Assyria would return to their own land. Now, a little background, and you can read this in, uh, I think it's Second Chronicles, that when the Assyrians invaded Israel, some of the people fled to Egypt for help. Well, I mean, that really wasn't a whole lot of help to them because the Assyrians wound up conquering Egypt as well. And so they wound up being caught by those. I, I mean, that would be like running to one enemy to escape from another. Well, you're probably not really going to be much better off. Um, and so they had been held captive by both nations, but God is promising that despite the rebellion, that he's going to bring them back to his land and to their place in his land. Micah 7, verse 13. Yet the land shall be desolate because of those who dwelt in it and for the fruit of their deeds. Now, God has just promised that he's going to bring back his people to the land. And yet when Cyrus the king, the Persian king, uttered the decree that the people could return, very few people did. So the land was very sparsely populated. They were free to go home, but not that many did. There were a few brave souls who did. Um, but many had become comfortable 
in the land of their captivity. Kind of like we are sometimes. We get comfortable with where we're living, how we're living. And, and when God calls us to, to return to him, we're a little kind of balk about it. And many of, of the people of God did the same. There were only a few that did return. The land was indeed almost desolate. Jeremiah chapter 12, 7 through 13 speaks of that. And Jeremiah was a prophet who, who had prophesied of God's judgment upon a people that refused to listen to his warnings that Jeremiah himself saw the Assyrians come into and conquer Israel. He was part of the captives. <clears throat> but he, early in his ministry, he was given this prophecy. I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of their enemies. My heritage is to me like a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. My heritage is to me like a speckled vulture. The vultures all around are against her. Come, assemble all the beasts of the field. Bring them to devour. Many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate. Desolate it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. The plunders have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness. For the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat but reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain but do not profit. But be ashamed of your harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. The cry of Jeremiah and the, and the cry of the God that he represents and that he's speaking for is that his people have become desolate, not because God wants to make them desolate, but because they have chosen to live in rebellion to him. And when we choose to live in sin, it brings loss. It brings suffering. It being, brings sorrow. It brings all those things to us. It brings those things to everyone that's around us. And they have become desolate because of the fruit of their doings. <clears throat> Again, Jeremiah 21, 13, and 14 speak of that. Jeremiah 21, 13, and 14. Behold, I am against you, O an inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, says the Lord, who say, who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter our dwellings? But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, says the Lord. I will kindle a fire in its forest, and it shall devour all things around it. And Micah 3, 11 and 12 also speak of that desolation that come as a result of the fruit of our doings. Now also many nations have gathered against you who say, Let her be defiled, and let her eye look upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather, I'm, I'm reading from the wrong chapter. No wonder that didn't make sense. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay, I was reading from chapter 4. Chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Her heads judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for pay. Her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, he is not the Lord among us. No harm can come upon us. So the people are putting their trust in empty religious rituals. Well, that's what they're used to with their idols. I mean, the attractiveness of an idol, to, to anyone who is attracted to an idol, is all of uh, an idol demands of us is some kind of surface obedience. It doesn't demand our heart. In any kind of an idol, whatever it is. Whether, whether it's the uh, stone or wooden image that the, uh, the pagan bows down to, or whether it's the, the idol of financial success or the idol of fame or whatever idol might be out there, it, it doesn't demand our heart. It costs our heart, but it doesn't demand our heart from the get-go. And so the attraction of that is I can do my own thing, and all I got to do is do whatever this, this thing is. 
God demands our heart. He demands our love. He deserves our love because he has paid the ultimate price for our love. Back to Micah 7.14. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. I'd like to compare that to Psalm 28, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 28, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. In both of these scriptures, God uses the term through, through David in Psalm 28 and through Micah. He uses the term to shepherd, uses that verb. Well, that's something that, that uh, the people of Israel were very familiar with. They were an agrarian society. Sheep were a necessary part of their livelihood. I mean, it was not a job that had any sort of status whatsoever, but it was very necessary. I mean, I mean, I, I guess probably the, the closest analogy to a, well, you got to have food, you got to have clothing, and those things came from that. Um, and <clears throat> farming is not generally considered a high-status job in, in, in a modern culture, but it's very necessary. Without farming, we don't eat. <laughs> but the, the distinction of shepherd as opposed to somebody who grows crops in a field or whatever, is that sheep are totally dependent upon the shepherd for their livelihood. They're not smart enough to avoid poisonous plants. They have no zero defenses against predators. They can't outrun predators. They can't outfight predators. They can't outthink predators. If they don't have a shepherd, they're just a they're just a buffet surface for whatever local predators are around. And so <clears throat> Micah and David are recognizing that far from boasting in whatever military prowess they might have, whatever economic prowess they might have, that they are, they are and we are totally dependent upon God for our protection and our provision. Because without his help, we can do absolutely nothing. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, in Micah 5, verse 4, and he shall stand and feed his flock, speaking of God, in the strength of the Lord, again, using the analogy of a shepherd, in the majesty of the name of the Lord our God, and they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. It's a recognition of God. As a shepherd, I mean, you can really compare it very strongly to Psalm 23. Then he goes on to say, who dwell solitarily in a woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Now, Carmel, and I encourage you to, to, to look this up on your own. In 1 Kings 18, Carmel, if you've got your map here, is close to the to the uh, Mediterranean Sea. But what's significant to the people of Israel is that it was the site of Elijah's confrontation with the worship of Baal. And centuries later, the people were still following idols. And they'd gone into captivity because they refused to follow the living God and they were following idols. But, but God is saying that even in that center of idolatry, he will have a people who follow him. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead. Uh, Bashan is an area that's right next to Syria. It's a borderland. And the problem with any borderland, from anybody who's ever lived in a borderland between two hostile countries, is the first place that you're going to get, the first place that's going to be invaded is your hometown. You know, every army that's going to go through is going to go through your town. And that was the, the kind of place Bashan was. 
So even in the midst of turmoil and stress and constant fighting back and forth, because there were very t few times in the history of Israel that, that uh, they weren't enemies of each other between Israel and Syria. There were times that they were allies. Allies are not the same thing as enemies. Allies get together. Well, they, they can get together together because they're friends, but more often they get together because they have a con common enemy that they realize if we don't fight together, we're both going to get conquered. Um, and there were a few times when Israel and Syria were were allies, but they were never on friendly terms as nations. And so Bashan was in that border area that was constantly invaded by one country or another. But he's saying that even in the midst of that, they will feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old, that there will be peace. Verse 15, as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. Wonders specifically refers to miraculous deliverances. And there are several um, examples where that is depicted in, in the memory of Israel and in our Old Testament where God's wonders are shown, his miraculous deliverances. Exodus 3, verse 20. This is when Moses is called to confront Pharaoh. I would like to read from Exodus 34, verse 10. Exodus 34, verse 10. And he, speaking of God, said, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels or wonders such as not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among who you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. This is after they've come out of the land of Egypt. They've received the law. They've turned away from God. They've received another copy of the law. Moses has made it his intercession for the people. And God has promised that not only will he forgive them, but he will continue to do wonders to bring them into the land of promise. That is, those wonders are recounted, and I encourage you to look this up, in Psalm 78, 12 through 16, and Psalm 106, verses 19 through 23, and Psalm 136, verse 4. But I would like to close with reading from Psalm chapter 78, verses 12 through 16. And many times in the Psalms, David and Asaph and the other Psalm writers are encouraging God's people to remember the works that he's done on their behalf. That's good advice for all of us. Because many times we are very tempted to feel very discouraged. Life can seem really hard, and it, it can be a, a great encouragement to go back and remember those things that God has done for us, for people we know, that he's done throughout history for his people. Psalm 78, 12 through 16. Marvelous things he, speaking of God, did in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea. And caused them to pass through. He made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud. And all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness. And gave them drink in abundance from the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock. And caused waters to run down like rivers. <clears throat> so recounting God's marvelous works. In leading a huge nation. Through a. A terrible wilderness that without the work of God they would have died in just a matter of days of, of thirst he provided water and food for this huge number of people and protection from their enemies and brought them safely into the land that he promised them in the same way we can trust that God will do his deliverance in our lives now does that mean we don't have to go through a wilderness well they wandered through that wilderness for 40 years uh, primarily because they were stubborn and hard-hearted, uh, kind of like we are sometimes. But he brought them through to bring them into that land they had promised them. And he gives us that same hope and that same 
future. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that you are the same God who delivers your people now as you delivered them then. Regardless of how long we may need to wander through a wilderness, whether we need to wander through a wilderness through for days, weeks, months, or the rest of our earthly lives, you are the God who is our deliverer. You are the God who is our provider. You are the God who brings us into your land of promise. And we thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you very much. God bless you.